All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Torn Tuesday, your weekly dose of all things Tolkien. We've been doing this show for 13 years, and I'm really excited for today's show. But before we introduce our guest, here's your host with the most, Clifford Broadway, the producer and writer of Ringer's Lord of Fans and author of People's Guide to J.R.R. Tolkien. Hello, Cliff. Hello and good morning. Um, perhaps I meant that it was a morning to be good on when I just said that. But um, I'm feeling delighted about our very special guest today. And I'm on my best behavior, which is going to be rather unusual for a Torn Tuesday. But I do welcome the entire audience joining us here for another conversation about the world and the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. And none, you know, none other than Andrew Lesney was on our mind. Uh, may he rest in peace. He was the great Oscar-winning cinematographer of The Lord of the Rings and, of course, Babe. And he worked on The Hobbit trilogy and some other remarkable films. And uh, by by nature of that conversation, Justin got his magic powder into the world, the magic magical uh, sprinkling pixie dust that got us this wonderful gentleman who is here to talk with us about all things cinematography and really cool stuff. Um, I'm so proud to say we have a wonderful guest, and this is our chance to, to now introduce Oscar winner Greg Fraser, cinematographer and man about town. Welcome <laughs> aboard, Greg. It's so good Thank to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's great to be uh, talking to such passionate people about uh, yeah, films. I mean, I, I've, I've talked to a lot of very passionate sort of Frank Herbert, uh, you know, diehards. So to talk to uh, similar diehards for another author is, is is awesome. So thank you. You you might be surprised, Greg, that the overlap of this Venn diagram is very small. It includes yeah. what was the very next book when I read as a 12 year old after I finished reading The Return of the King? What was the very next thing I read? Uh... Frank Herbert. Yes. There you go. Obsessed, been obsessed with him and his works my entire life. So let's let's dive in. This is going to be so delightful, I'm, and well, I'm so grateful for you coming across the pond and you know having to you know join us. This started because uh, so many tweets and so many social commentary when Dune Two just came out uh, about a month ago was like this is the greatest film since Lord of the Rings: The Two Towers. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I've screenshotted so many. Uh, comments and tweets and that got massive social numbers, whatever that means. You know, it was saying, all organic. This was all organic. This wasn't by the studio planting a marketing seed. This was actual fandom responding this way. So, uh, so that's why I was like, "What is going on here? Like, this movie is that great?" So, Greg, have you been following like the all of that commentary and those comparisons? Yeah, I mean, it's been wild because, you know, obviously there are a number of films that, that one holds up in high regard, you know, Two Towers being one, you know, Empire Strikes Back being another, you know, so there are any comparisons to those. And, and as you said, genuine comparisons, not the marketing hype that goes along with a, with a tagline that sits on a poster or a, or a teaser or something, more about, more about the, 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 the fan base or about the comments. Like I've had more... I've had more interaction about Dune Part Two than I have about any other movie that I've that I've done, and you know I've been very fortunate to have done some films that people are passionate about. So um, to have more interactions with people via social media in in this on the street, uh, you know I've got I had people come up to me on the street to talk about Dune Part Two, which is for a cinematographer who who likes to stay in the shadows deliberately, uh, to have that sort of level of interaction is kind of quite bonkers. I can't imagine. I can't imagine someone who is used to being behind the scenes in the yeah. most literal sense is suddenly in front of, of the public eye. That is, is that surreal? Well, it's surreal. It's, it's uncomfortable. I will be frank because mm. I, I, for me, I deliberately, I think the good thing about film business is that there's it, a job for everybody, regardless of your personality. Like if you don't like to talk to anybody, there's a job in the workshop making models. Like if you like to talk to everybody, there's there's marketing or there's being on set. You know, like there's there's jobs for every every personality in a film set. Mm -hmm. um, so for me personally, like I, you know, I'm not a big fan of doing publicity or PR. I'm not a big fan of self promotion. Um, you know, I like to get on with the work. I like to do the best work that I can. I like to make films that are 
that, that are moving, you know, emotionally moving and, and, and that can kind of change the path of uh, filmmaking. It sounds a little bit sort of, you know, self, self um, kind of grandiosing, but like, I want to be able to make films that kind of are different to the last films that were made. So, you know, to, to have that recognition um, for June part two is wild. It's fantastic. And it's good because it's genuine. This is why, this is why it's exciting because it's genuine. You get real fans, people that get passionate about filmmaking. So, yeah. It, it, mm. we, we, we've heard the similar, uh, uh, comments, agendas, whatever you want to call it from, from the folks at Weta that worked on Lord of the Rings and, um, you know, and, and, and the, the New Zealand, a crew on Lord of the Rings have made themselves available to fans uh, in, in a way that that most other studio projects and people haven't. And then you know, I, I've I've seen you on so many podcasts over the last few months. Like you've made yourself available. Is, is there something about the kind of uh, you know New Zealand uh, uh, entertainment biz that that says you know this is all about the fans? not just Lord of the Rings, but like just movie fans. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, the, the one thing that I will say that, that the Australians and the New Zealanders share is a kind of a, you know, we we're a small industry, um, you know, and, and the, the fact that, I mean, I remember, you know, I've worked in New Zealand a few times um, on nothing, no big films in New Zealand, but I've worked on, you know, I did my, one of my first features down in Dunedin um, and you know, effectively, that's a that's a that's a um, Lord of the Rings country. You know what I mean? Everybody, mm -hmm. everybody on the crew had some relationship to Lord of the Rings in some way, shape, or form. They either were a trainee on it, or they were the head of a department on it, or so it, it like it's a it, it permeates. And I don't think you can get out of New Zealand film business without somebody talking about being on Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit or something. So. It permeates, and I think being maybe I don't know if it's a it's, it's a nationalistic thing or being Australian, but I, I would like to. I, I enjoy talking about my craft. You know, I don't enjoy publicising it. That's a different thing. Being a mm -hmm. being a, on a publicity machine mm -hmm. versus actually just chatting about it, having a good old chat. You know, that's a that's a different story. So, yeah. Mm. Well, let's let's start for let's start with our, for a non technical audience, if we can say that. Please imagine that we have lots of book fans, Tolkien book yep. fans, and Tolkien yep. movie fans, and if we're gonna just dial in for your feelings on Andrew Lesney's work, and let's say, I I mean, what is it you think that made it so magical? Because a lot of people use the phrase "lightning in the bottle," and mm -hmm. I've heard that phrase applied over and over again for 23 years about the work that Peter and his whole team, and, and I mean a lot of brave New Zealanders, great great synergy between leading departments and everybody. But what was it about Andrew Lesney's work that really made things shine, and from your opinion? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a good question because, you know, as I was coming up in the industry in Australia, obviously Andrew played a really big part of, you know, um, the, the, the industry in, in Australia and New Zealand, you know, they're, they're kind of interlinked. The, the Australian New Zealand industry, as much as they would both like to believe that, that they're not, they are, they are. And so, you know, Andrew would often do that trip across, across the Tasman, you know, mm. Wellington to Sydney. And I think he, I think he lived in Sydney, didn't he? So, um, uh, you know, growing up as a cinematographer and doing small films and small commercials and music videos, I mean, Andrew, what Andrew did really, really well was he was able to shapeshift as a cinematographer, which is what I personally have tried to, to do myself. Like, you know, he went from something like The Delinquents back in 1990, I think, um, which was a small little Australian movie, um, to The Babe, which was a bigger film, to Lord of the Rings, to The Hobbit. Like, he, he literally kind of just, he flitted from genre to genre without, without being stuck in one particular place. And so, you know, again, I can't speak for why um, Peter Jackson chose him as a cinematographer, but I can imagine why, because, you know, he had that skill and expertise to be able to technically pull it off, but also aesthetically to be able to kind of bring something to it that, as you said, like just to add to that lightning in a bottle along with the, 
the design and the costumes and the you know all those all those things that so i think you know i'm sure peter would have seen something in in andrew's work that just would have been quite enthralling and 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 clearly he he was right you know it also seems that uh, andrew lesney was uh fearless in his uh, mm. adoption of technology i mean by the time you get to the hobbit movies he's shooting on stereo 3d uh yep. cameras like, like in camera not not post 3d but he, he uh, so he obviously wasn't mm-hmm. afraid to play with new technology and and and, and are you are you it seems like you aren't afraid either i mean you you you've uh proudly used unreal and uh for yeah. pre-production and and you did uh the mandalorian and stuff so um it, it, it is there something that kind of sets you guys apart in your thinking of technology versus I don't, maybe I, I mean again i can't i can't speak for any other industry in terms of you know i, I know incredible amazing uh, Irish cinematographers and Scottish cinematographers and in French and German, like I, I know a ton. American cinematographers, Canadian, I know a ton of them, but I, but I can only really speak for the Australians. So you know, by me saying this, I'm not excluding any of those other fantastic countries. So let me just put 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 that flag out. Um, but but in Australia, you and New Zealand, you we don't have much, we don't have many resources. Like it really, we don't have many resources. Like we we don't have if you're shooting a film in Hollywood, you've literally got the rental houses of the dolly companies up the road, so you can pretty much design anything you want. You've got everything based there. The the, the thing about Australians and New Zealanders is there's a lot of ingenuity that goes along with building rigs and building equipment and building things. You know, what one of my one of my favorite groups of people are my Australian and New Zealand grips because you can effectively solve any problem with couple of bits of stick and a bit of rope and a you know like i've seen it i've seen it and, it, and yeah. it's and, and i personally don't have an engineering mind but i know people that do in a part of my crew and so um i i think when it comes to technology and adoption of new technology i think there's there's just the there's there's no i think that there's no idea that this is how it's done like i think the idea of this is how it's done is a bit of a foreign idea where you know we have done it like that but let's do it like this or they they did it like this we don't think that's right let's do it like this so that idea of sticking into a, a groove and and this is where i guess a film like we're going back to, to to peter jackson and and andrew is that someone like peter you know decided that that he didn't want to do it the way that that hollywood have done things in the past you know the idea of you know building studios um in warehouses and like you know he he had a a different plan you know and he did it the way that that australians and new zealanders do it which is differently and i think that the the adoption of new technology is something where um i love because frankly i get bored quickly (laughs) with with the old ways of doing things but i just i'd like to experiment and and andrew did the same thing you know like the idea of the way they shot Hobbit was a really imaginative idea. Peter Jackson was one of the first people to to embrace the red the red one camera. You know when he did um, you know those short films that he did. So I remember watching those. Yeah, you know, I was all the way in Melbourne watching those tests that he'd done, and I was like, "That's pretty amazing," you know. So yeah, yeah. Well, um, I um, I re- I remember distinctly, and many of the Lord of the Rings fans do. Uh, the story about how Galadriel got the sparkle in her eyes. And it is similar to what you just said with, you know, the crew sticking together some tape and a couple of sticks and a string of lights, Christmas lights Mm -hmm. that had been bundled into a ball. And Andrew had presented these as a reflective light source so that when you're looking at the beautiful irises of Kate Blanchett's eyes, you you would see the floating sparkle of lights that were you know, reflected in her eyes. Have, have you ever, you know, just picked up things by your bootstraps on a yeah. set and, and said, yeah. oh, let's, let's tape this together and put it together like this and, and you get an extraordinary effect. You've had that happen well, too? Well, I've had to. We've had to, you know, like, yeah. you know, I, I did an Australian movie in, in South Australia, which is one of the states in the southern parts of Australia, um, which is why it's called South Australia. 
But um, yeah, we had we were doing a night scene in a car, Hugo Weaving's driving in a car, and we didn't have enough money to to, to light Hollywood style, so we had some some like um, polystyrene, and we bought some fairy lights from the local hardware store, some <laughs> Christmas lights, drilled holes, stuck them in, and and tra- strapped them to the front of the wind the windshield. You know, like it's it, it and it worked. You know, we ran it off the ran off the battery of the car, and and it, and it worked. Like it was, I mean, but but you know, this is the thing. What I love is that it, that was okay. That was very early in my career, mm. but frankly, that doesn't really change. What changes is, I guess, what um, you know we experienced on June, and what you know Andrew and Peter experienced on 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 their films was that like being given resources to do something doesn't mean you have to necessarily spend them the way they were spent. So coming up with ways to spend those resources in a really imaginative way that creates something sort of bigger than what it would have created if you'd done it traditionally. So, you know, we, we, we did a lot of things, you know, very non-traditionally a little bit in Dune Part 2. We did, you know, there's some Aaliyah, um, the Aaliyah uh, character, which is a, you know, as you know, it's a, uh, fetus that speaks to her mother um it's a you know quite an odd little character she is um you know we were talking about how to do that and we we effectively just got a, a, a we puppeted like a, a doll effectively that was what it was we just had a, a, a doll made and there was no real mechanics or lines or puppeteers it was kind of just you know sticks a couple of little sticks in a in a in a liquid sack like it was you know we we tested every way the most expensive ways possible in creating animatronics and you know um puppeteered and and cg and we ended up just doing it the cheapest way imaginable and it looked the best that's wild i thought that you were striking a little bit into david lynch surreal territory with the 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 talking fetus that was the the only thing that lynch did not do was have his fetus talk in, in 1984 he just he just had it there, but that that was well, really, really remarkable. It's funny, that, it's funny that the talking fetus was it was too far for Lynch. You know what I mean? Like that's kind of yeah. That, says that was a too lot far for David. Now, one while we're on the subject, is there or is there not a less than subtle reference by Mr. Villeneuve to Blue Velvet? Because when I see the ants, the bugs going inside uh, a certain character's ear. The super tight close up on that ear. I'm thinking, yeah. oh goodness, is that a small little blue velvet reference in there? That's interesting, isn't it? Uh, I don't, I can't answer that. I do not know. You will need okay. to get Denis on your on your uh, show, and you'll need to ask him. But but it, that was not that was not talked about. No. Okay. How about the, okay. Is the fetus a reference to 2001? No, it's 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 well in the book. So mm. you know, I, I I think that it's well in the book. So no, n- n- it's not directly 2001 it's funny isn't it because for me when i was referencing how this could look i tried to find as many references that that uh that i could that would suit um and i could not find any like i I looked at 2001 i looked at like the other other films that have you know in utero images uh music videos there's a massive attack music video that that's out there nothing 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 worked as a reference for us so i had to really get delve deep into the Mm. You know, into the testing process. Speaking of uh, uh, references, uh, there was a couple questions uh, we fielded from from the fans the last couple weeks. Uh, in the Batman, in the first scene of when Batman enters the crime scene, um, yeah, uh, a, a few fans uh, got this vibe, like an Edward Scissorhands vibe, that. Oh. For the first time, we're feeling Batman is the one out of place. Was that intentional to make him feel like a fish out of water at a crime scene? Let me tell you something. I, we, the Edward, Edward Scissorhands thing is an interesting reference. We did not, that never occurred, to be frank, but by that film. Mm. But the out of, out of place, absolutely. Like the, the, the idea that you've got this kind of hulking kind of leather clad um you know guy in the middle because that that's the actually the whole point of the scene is that is that he's he's met with distrust 
um, you know, people are kind of, you know, the, the, the cop calls him freak as he walks past, you know, like they, they, they don't want him there. And, and even the commissioner kind of says to Gordon, it's like, what are you doing letting him in? Like it's, so the, the, we absolutely did shoot and frame with the idea that he is not supposed to be there. And, mm -hmm. but he went, he just goes along with it. You know, like he, he, he didn't, he, he wasn't, wasn't concerning to Batman what people thought of him. He just continued on. So yeah, it was very much that. And we tried to make sure he was bigger than people, taller than people, you know, even though Rob Patterson's not necessarily much taller than, than, than everybody else, if at all, you know, we tried at times to sort of fudge, you know, to make him look bigger and taller and just a bit more menacing, just to sub subconsciously kind of make him feel a little bit like a, like a lumbering kind of, um, you know, uninvited guest in the middle of this kind of party. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, uh, people picked up on, the, on this unique uh, characterization of Batman that uh, hadn't been seen portrayed in this aspect uh, with all of the Batman movies that have come out from so yeah. many uh, actors and directors, you know, uh, uh, no one had thought to put him as the fish out of water in this situation. You know, he's always the yeah. alpha. He is, and that's but that's why I love Matt Reeves and his take on Batman because, you know, Matt didn't want to go along with the world that Batman had inhabited up to that point. You know, we'd. We'd all seen the Justice League Batman and the Ben Affleck Batman, you know, the guy that's life is together and that he's figured it out. And, you know, he, like that wasn't this Batman. This Batman is kind of year, it's that year one, year two Batman. He's just trying to figure himself out. He's not, you know, he's he's still having trouble balancing Bruce Wayne and Batman psychologically in his own world. Like he hasn't figured out how to use his wealth to his effect except for the the, the stuff he builds you know, and, and the advantages he has technologically. So that's where I love Matt's take on it. Matt, Matt's got a great take. And, and you know what, I, I think you should probably, if you get to talk to Matt, I don't think he would have been actually overly interested had he done a normal Batman. This is a, this is a, this is a, a different Batman. Well, the choice, your choice to like do a lot of close-ups, like real close-ups to kind of, it feels like you're getting in, to the psyche of the character, uh, uh, I think parallels a lot of stuff in Lord of the Rings. Like, like you know, there uh, there's a ton of shots, especially in the early movies. In the early movie for Fellowship, that it, they're just extreme close-ups. You're tight right here. Jackson and Lesney are getting into the psyche of the characters, kind of the fish yeah. out of water, the hobbits on this journey. And I got the same feeling, <laughs> both on on ba the Batman and uh somewhat on dune and the stronger paul gets the further away the camera is it feels like yeah. was that conscious yeah it, it was but but also the other thing that was conscious was actually is playing this game with paul's character because remember paul is self-doubt as well so he, he is flip-flopping himself like you know he's being told from one faction that he's the more i did from another faction that he's not he doesn't believe he is his mother believes he is like it's it's like you know he is kind of struggling himself with that realization i mean so, i think deep down he, he he does know but is you your know, camera placement I, telling that story it is because the, you know like when we are in there which we are there's a few moments particularly the first time he eats spice in the meal when he's back in the siege like that's probably the closest we ever get to paul and if you if you've happened to been able to see the film in IMAX it's it's you know Paul Atreides like the size of eight stories like it's 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 overwhelmingly close you know it's overwhelmingly tight which is the point the point that it's supposed to be slightly uncomfortable and you know because that's it's, it's, he's eating his spice for the first time mm -hmm. not experiencing it for the first time just eating it for the first time <laughs> there's um there are techniques that we see in um, in the Batman, and, uh, techniques uh, involving uh, the symmetry of the shot, uh, leading lines, and um, s very specific compositions. Did mm -hmm. you find it useful to employ some of the same compositions and the same uh, symmetries in Dune as you did in prior work? Well, there, there is, there, there's really, um, on Batman, it was very center framed, like very mm -hmm. much center framed, because you know, 
like if you look at films from the 70s, they were pretty much all center framed because the lenses didn't perform. You know, the edges of the frame were all, because they were anamorphic, they were always falling off, they're out of focus. So it, it's a technique aesthetically that I think we've grown to understand where everything is pretty much center framed. You know, you wouldn't sort of put anything beyond this circle in the center of the frame um, <laughs> because it would fall out of focus or it would fall out of, you know, out of um, resolution. Um, I don't think we, I don't think framing wise, I specifically followed that same thing because we were framing for IMAX on June part two. Mm. So yes, even though center frame is an important thing, it's making sure that the, 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 the lines are here, you know, that the framing is kind of in the middle, across the middle, so that we had peripheral vision top and bottom. Um, so yeah. Have you is noticed? There, is there any discomfort? I was gonna. I'm sorry. Is there any discomfort in what happens in home video releases, uh, like a year or two down the line, when your compositions are set for IMAX and suddenly people are watching it at home in a very different aspect ratio? Um, do you yeah. do you way ahead of time want to accommodate for that somehow? Or on video, or or yeah, like yeah. Said, or on airplane, or on the iPhone, or on the iPad, or like all the way. You know, if Netflix gets their hands on it, or yeah, yeah absolutely, and it causes it causes a lot of anxiety. But it's not even just mm. things that are out of my control. Like I know that even though we've framed for IMAX, it's also going to be released in two four zero at most cinemas across the country, across the world, actually. It's very small, select cinemas. I think IMAX only has one or two percent of the cinemas in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, mm. like it's not it's not a massive amount. So even though we are making a film for one percent of the cinemas, we know that we have to frame it for ninety nine percent. So yeah, it does cause a little bit of anxiety, particularly when you know my whole job is framing and lighting. You know, and then I go and see it in a cinema, and that wasn't the framing that I am the most proudest of. Yeah, it, it causes a little bit of anxiety. A, a bunch of our fans were curious uh, since you've worked in both film and TV prestige tv i should say uh <laughs> what are the uh, uh workflow differences like that is is doing like the mandalorian the same kind of director cinematographer relationship uh or um yeah just kind of i say i say something like rogue one well it's a little bit it's a little bit different because t television has a showrunner and you know generally as a cinematographer I'll have a a one person that I that I work for. Like it's I have a north star. Like it, it which is I need. I, I feel like we all need as as uh, filmmakers. We need a north star, and that director is our north star. So um, on TV, there's a showrunner, and that's the north star. That's the person who who basically has the final say on everything. You know, mm -hmm. um, aesthetically and visually. And so on the Mandalorian, that was John Favreau. Um, you know, um, Dave was one of the directors, but he was also one of the producers. So he had a very big say. You know, that the directors of each episode also had you know their own bent on things, but they were effectively following the path of, of the showrunner. So it is a slightly different methodology um, than say something like Rogue One, where again, you know, like you've got the the one North Star, the, the Gareth Edwards who. Um, you know, who had the kind of the, the vision for the entire process or the Denis Villeneuve on Dune or the Matt Reeves on, on Batman who, like, they are the North Star. So TV is a little more complicated in that you're navigating a little bit more, you know, through through different different leaders. But, but you know, it's true. And it also the other difference was on Mandalorian, I had uh, another cinematographer that I was working with too. So that was a collaboration Huh. Between myself and and Baz, who was the other cinematographer, which I must say, I, I mean, Baz is a friend of mine, so I, I knew that was going to work out. But I've always thought that was a bit of an odd one. Like, who's got the final say? Like, there's got to be a, you know, the buck has to stop oh. with someone, right? And, you know, otherwise you end up with right. with, you know, two tenths of nothing. Um, but working in a collaboration with Baz was fantastic. So I really enjoyed that collaboration, which I would have never done on a movie. You know, on a movie. You 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 work with um, other cinematographers who are maybe doing a second unit or doing a miniatures unit or maybe doing uh -huh. um, uh, like additional photography, 
Um, but, you know, it very much is a pyramid of, of kind of the, the head cinematographer and, and other cinematographers that work underneath them. So, so um, I, let, I had intended to ask you something about that. Uh, we can get back to that later. Go ahead, Justin. Well, yeah. bringing that back to, to Cliff's last question about like the formats, you know, IMAX all, all the way to your phone. Uh, similarly, on a TV show, like, you know, you're, you're doing a, a few episodes of a TV show. Is there any uh, effort or concern or, or a thought process of like, what does the cinematographer in season three look like? You know, if you're setting the the early stage of the Mandalorian, say, you know, yep. the look and yep. feel in the cinema, uh, you, you know where I'm going is, is like if you if you have concerns about, you know, the downstream formats of your big movies, are there any concerns about the downstream like later season looks of your TV shows? Um, I, I tend to feel that the, the person ultimately responsible, that's going to be the showrunner unless I'm on every season which it's not practical really like you know it's just not practical for me to do that and, and it's not it's it just doesn't work like that for me anyway um so it's not so much that there's a concern because obviously i can only do what i can do i'm only one person doing one thing at a time um but i i have to personally rely on on you know someone like john favreau hiring the right cinematographer going forward which he clearly has proven that he has chosen the right cinematographers going forward. So, you know, what I've seen of those series, I've been, you know, super interested. I mean, the, the thing about The Mandalorian was that the reason, I mean, I, I always obviously love Jon Favreau and I love, you know, Star Wars universe, um, but it, developing the volume for motion picture was the, was the ultimate goal for that series for me. You know the you know that 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 volume technology ILM had been working on with myself since Rogue One. You know the first big volume that we had built that employed that technology was for all the all the dog fighting scenes in Rogue One. You know we put all the ships on it, we put the X wings on it, like just to create the right reflections and and all those things. And and ILM knew that this technology was coming down the pike, so they they embraced that idea to, to use the LED volume for Rogue One for lighting, you know, because I had to figure out a way to to, to program all the lights. And, and I said, like, the best way is to do it with LED screens, the way that Chivo did it on, you know, Gravity and Claudio did it on Oblivion. Like, they lit with the set. You know, the set was in camera. And so wow. the, the purpose of Mandalorian was to, say, come up with a way, that, a set of rules that we could say okay these scenes work on the volume these scenes don't work on the volume and make it look good you know at, at a budget and and you know with a uh with a, with a cost saving to production less location moves less set builds all those things that cost money do right. you think uh do, does the volume lend itself to fantasy storytelling I think that's what what's top of mind for Lord of the Rings fans, you know, because we've got Amazon's doing all these TV shows. Warner Brothers is going to be doing more movies, you know. That, that like you're probably one of the biggest experts of the volume at this point. Does it lend itself to that style of storytelling? I th I think so. I, I I I will always say that the volume is actually a lighting thing rather than a than than a background thing because. We know for oh. a fact backgrounds back. Well, that's my opinion, and because I'm a cinematographer, you talk to a you talk to a VFX supervisor, and they'll be like, "No, it's a you know, it's a it's a it's a background thing." But I I have a, an opinion about it, and that is that the volume, like everything you see on me right now, is not, none of my lighting is caused by what's behind me. You know what I mean? Except for maybe there's a slight highlight on the edge of my head coming from that window, but for the most part. 90% of everything exists behind the camera. So therefore you would say that this room is a volume, as it is, it's a volume of light. Um, the light that's hitting the camera is reflecting off the walls instead of an LED screen. But the thing that's lighting me is off your camera right now, off screen. So for me, the volume is a lighting, a lighting tool more than anything. 
And so if you choose and design your sets well to take advantage of the fact that it's inbuilt lighting, then yes, it absolutely can do fantasy. But, you know, like, like everything, it can be done badly. You know, any style or genre can be done badly on the volume and, and can look, look hokey. Um, Peter Jackson and his team were famous for using miniatures that were so large they were called mm -hmm. bigotures. And he had a, a separate uh, team. And he had a, a supervising director of photography, Alex Funky, who worked on the bigotures. And I'm imagining in my mind some of the synergy and the work that had to be done between Andrew Lesney on his own and, you know, getting main shots and having them work together so that they married so well with the bigotures photography, which was usually done separately. Uh, did yeah. you encounter anything like that working on Dune 1 or 2 using miniatures or working with a team of people doing different photography than yourself? Uh, absolutely. I mean, that, that that's a huge part of, you know, what we did on both of those films, including Batman as well. You know, in Batman we had, um, I had a second unit who did, you know, on Batman all the, the car chasing, all the car chase. But I also had little inserts that needed to be done really, really well on the Batman. Like, for example, there's at the beginning of the film, you know, there's there's close ups of water hitting the um, the glass in front of the bat signal and bouncing off and sizzling and steaming. And, you know, and, and there's a shot of, a, of the of the globe coming on on the bat signal. You know, so there are these these really interesting, beautiful shots that um, needed time and energy to to do. Um, similarly, the, 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 all the Aaliyah um, photography on June Part 2, like that, you know, it, that was a tricky, as we talked about, it's a tricky character. And when done badly or, or hastily, could have not really had the effect or the impact that we wanted. So in that sense, I had a um, another cinematographer, Christoph Brandl, who, you know, he, would ha he worked with a small crew um, he would spend hours and hours and hours lighting, which is something on a film film set you can't really do. Like I'm not ever allowed the 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 pleasure of just lighting for hours. It doesn't exist. There's too much at stake and too mm. many people standing around with their clipboards to taking note of all the time that you're wasting. Like you know, part of my job is is as much as it is being creative and being the artiste and you know being all kind of like la di da. It's 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 getting it done like it, it sounds really kind of brutal but a big part of my job is just getting it done you know um and trying to navigate that in the best way possible whereas someone like christoph on june part two danny villa on june part one um you know like they were able to um fraser rig on um uh, and Julian Mawson on, on Batman, they were able to play, you know, they, they had a small unit that would play for hours and hours and hours. And I was supervising that and giving them feedback on how that would work. And I imagine, you know, I wasn't privy to the way that the cinematographers worked on, on Andrew's films, but I suspect it's the same thing. You know, it's Andrew gives a brief, you know, in conjunction with, with Peter, um, cinematographer shoots it. They all look at dailies together at the end of a day cracking a beer, having a drink, you know, and commenting on the on the day's work, only to maybe go and revise it the next day, or to change it or to 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 pivot in a slightly different direction. So bigotures are a fantastic way of shooting. I, I personally I love shooting bigotures. It's you can't beat it. You can't beat it. I mean, have you ever seen pictures? How how big were the bigotures in Lord of the Rings? What well scale? when I when I went to the Te Papa National Museum yeah. in Wellington, I had the chance to see the bigature of Baradur, the Dark Tower uh, of Sauron. And it was mm -hmm. uh, breathtaking. And I could say that it, it was nearly two and a half stories. I mean, almost three stories tall. It was wow. in this, this cavernous space in the National Museum. Um, and of course, it's probably back having been disassembled into segments and put in Peter's warehouse in Miramar. That's probably where it is now. But yeah. uh, I, I've i also seen, when visiting the Weta workshop, I saw the uh, the 116th scale of the city of Minas Tirith. 
And mm -hmm. maybe it wasn't 116. Maybe it was 1 to 64. But it was in an airplane hangar. Massive. It was mind-blowing. And um, I can imagine the weeks that they spent swooping cranes around yeah. the outside of Minas Tirith. And we see those gorgeous shots in The Return of the King when the Nazgul on their fell beasts are flying and attacking different rings of the city. Um, to get that vertigo, that, that precipitous sense of being in a very, very tall mountain-built city that's up against Mount Mindaluan, uh, and these horrifying creatures flying around. It was, it was amazing to, to see it uh, almost a couple of years away from the final end product. I saw the bigature, mind blown, and then didn't figure it out till maybe two and a half years later what yeah. the end result was in Return of the King. And it just boggles the mind when I stop and think about it. That's a, I mean, the craftsmanship, I mean, for me as a, as a fanboy of film, like seeing the craftsmanship that go into these things, you know, yeah. it's it's it is remarkable. It is remarkable. Not just not just miniatures and bigatures and but even just set pieces. You know, like I, I remember on um on Rogue One, we were shooting at a place called Cardington, which is a is a very famous studio in in North London in Bedford. And that's where they shot, I think, the exteriors on on episode four of Yavin. And it was mm. the first time I'd seen a seen a, an X Wing, a full size X Wing. They had two X Wings. Like proper size and it literally is like being a 10 year old again you see it and you're like oh you touch it and you're looking at the the artists doing the the, the exhaust the you know at the back they're painting the blackened exhaust around the you know the, the back of the the x-wing and you know it's really quite an amazing thing but then what happens it's funny what kicks in is your um the professional side of your, yourself myself where you know suddenly that now has become a big prop and not only is it a big prop, it's a pain in the butt because it's impossible to move. So like if I wanted to be in a position where I needed it to move camera right four foot, it's like half an hour, you know, like, so suddenly it becomes like a, a, a pain in the butt. So it's funny how you go from um, being fanboy like that, where you're just like mind blown to being a professional and like, ah, oh, the x-wing get it out of the way like move it it's, a, it's such a pain in the ass because it's such a big lump of a thing to being you know i saw it again on hollywood boulevard they rebuilt it for the premiere the rogue one premiere and this and again i'm a boy again it's funny how, how that kind of works is all this moving to digital then like uh, between the volume and 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 so much visual effects going into previs you know and the the quality of previs is going up like mm -hmm. Are bigatures and, and full size things like that just not going to be practical pretty soon because it's f f unreal is fast enough to like make yeah. make it? Mm. Y yes, yes and no. I mean, I think we're at a point right now in what is it, twenty twenty four? What is it, March twenty twenty four? And we can put this down in, in the records because in March twenty thirty four we might be going listen to that conversation from twenty twenty four. They're ridiculous, but. <laughs> Unreal is extraordinary, and it and 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 three D and um, v, VFX can do a lot of things that it, they couldn't do 10, 15, 20 years ago, when when Peter was designing the shots, Peter and Andrew were designing the shots. So, bigatures were the best thing for that. Now in twenty twenty four, th things are a bit different. CG, Unreal, three D game engine is a lot stronger than it ever was. So there are times where that can be really, really useful. But I still think, and I'm even talking about this to this day about films that I'm working on right now, where like, you know, even if you build a bigature to scan it, to go into Unreal. So it's like, you're still building it. You're still building it with real, real hands and real paint and real, you know, real finishing touches from the artists that, that make sets and do the, the do, do all the, um, the finishing paint work on it. So utilizing those skills, except you're scanning it with a 3D scanning app application, and that's going into, into the 3D program. So I don't think bigotures and model making is dead. I just think that, and I hope ideally it's not because some of the people that make those things are so talented. Um, I just think that it's going to be a little more, uh, for example, if you were to build three walls of you know, a set, 
you could scan those three walls and then alter the two or three of them to make another two or three walls in 3D. So you can actually make less of the set and and double them up and you know create some kind of um, uh, create some kind of economy that way. That would lend itself to television, I would think. Yeah, I mean, you'd be surprised though. Film film producers are always still trying to cheap it out. I mean, <laughs> the, I can say this with some of my really good friends being producers. You know, but they they can be cheap. They can be cheap. Well, not uh, maybe not just producers, uh, but now I'm thinking like, at what point does the fan film uh, become mm. a theatrical quality? You know, at what point is can mm. can anyone download Unreal? Can get go get an mm -hmm. FX nine like you guys did on the Creator and and, and FX three, FX three, and uh, and mm -hmm. and go shoot a, a Lord of the Rings fan film or Star Wars fan film, but it's like cinema quality. Because the tools are all kind of available to everybody. Um, it's a matter of days before that happens. Days. Like it might be happening right now. Mm. Films might be being made right now that that will come out that we, again March twenty twenty four. Mark this date on the calendar because there might be a film. And I'm not I'm not talking with any knowledge here, by the way. Not being I'm not trying to be kind of disingenuous and just in you know, any day now. <laughs> yeah. No, no, but but the, I I've seen it. I've seen the quality. You know, I, I, mm. it, I I've seen the quality about how good it can be. And I've seen the quality of all it takes is people to understand the technology. Because right now gamers are really the only ones that understand Unreal Engine. They're not filmmakers. But as filmmakers start to learn this and understand it, or as gamers start to become filmmakers or as film fans also have a gaming bent and learn this engine and then make a movie like a fan film like he said there's going to be fan films that come out that's going to knock, knock everyone's socks off it's either going to be you know another installment you know of a Tolkien um writing or it's going to be you know a small scene for you know some one of the June books or you know something there's going to be something or an original idea you know so I, I, I'm pretty passionate about that. I think that there's going to be there's going to be fan films done soon. So if so, if, if someone is is has youth and energy right now, uh, and wants to work on your team in five or ten years, what where would you uh, guide them to? Like start playing with Unreal or start playing with FX threes? Like um, I think there's a little bit of both. So I, I'm pushing all of my, my 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 take on it is that the people that I'm talking to cinematography students effectively mm -hmm. I'm saying need to put a put a foot into the 3D world 3D mm -hmm. game engine world not 3D goggles world not hobbit that, not hobbit different. 3D <laughs> not hobbit 3D I'm thinking, talking about 3D game engine so that's a different a different conversation um they need to put a foot in that world because they need to understand it because the eventually there will always be filmmakers as long as we survive as a human race there are going to be people that make films or tell stories in a in a medium that exists at the time and what i'm seeing is that the the the, the this format is becoming this this tool is becoming more prevalent so i'm suggesting that cinematographers who are training they de definitely learn how to use an fx3 i mean that's a that's a tool that's easy to kind of figure out but what's harder to figure out is shot construction storytelling editing the effect of lenses on on the emotion on like you know again you know talking to two people here that probably know those films those lord of the rings films back to front you probably know every shot and if you broke them down in terms of what lenses do and how they emote to you and what they say to the audience um that's what filmmakers should be studying. And then when they make their own fan film, they should be applying those learned knowledges to, you know, learned knowledge to the, to the films they're making. I'm glad you mentioned lenses. That naturally mm. segues into something I wanted to ask you because Twitter will not shut up about the lenses that you used, especially, here it is, okay, the Helios 44-2. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And can... Okay, I'm. This is okay. A non-technical audience coming to you 
for your grace and your wisdom. And thank you for sharing with us today, sir. Um, I saw that even uh, in Poor Things, it was Robbie Ryan who also used that. Because I didn't notice it until I noticed Twitter was saying, look around um, Christopher Walken's head and look yeah. at when we're on Kaitain. And you can see that you've used this uh, lens to create what is a radial bokeh. When yeah. I'm learning wonderful new terms. Okay. So you, you're, you're on something now. What, that's a, a larger part of the craft. It's not just to having the patience to light everything and light everything carefully, judiciously, and as fast as you can light things, but it's also your choices of lenses and how it impacts the story. Can you please give us your insights on that and some of your choices? Yeah, I mean, to correct one or two things you just said that that I believe, I don't believe Robbie Ryan used the Helios on Poor Things. I believe he used the Petzval, which, oh, okay. which okay. I, could be, I could be wrong, but everything I've heard is that he used the Petzval, not uh, Helios. Okay. The, the difference is that, is that there's a slight big geeky difference in terms of their construction. The pets file does what I, what you were just talking about, but extremely. Um, whereas the Helios is a, a couple of steps back from that, where it's a Soviet era lens that was made, you know, between 1965 and 1980. Again, I'm guessing I'm, I'm making up numbers here, but wow, you know, somebody Jur will Jurassic me. technology. <laughs> oh, fully, fully. But the thing is that. <laughs> The, the the argument that I would make is that we're using digital a digital camera that's the highest resolving camera that exists in the world right now with the Alexa 65. Yes. And so, you know, sometimes people do things so well, they're a little bit too good. You know, like sometimes things are too sharp and too... So you have to find lenses that pull the image back a little bit. And so in, in the case of that particular image, um, yeah, th that, that lens was something we used a fair bit of. But it, in a number of environments, you never would have been able to tell that it had that that deficiency or whatever you call that that characteristic, because whatever the background was didn't lend itself to to showing it to. You. That one absolutely did, and the reason is because, um, and that's an aesthetic choice that I made because this is the first time we're meeting the emperor. The emperor has literally just signed the death warrant for his, his, his you know, the man that he thought of like a son, Duke Trades. He literally just signed the death warrant. He knows he's been dead. He he was deep in thought. His world was kind of, um, you know, it was very much an insular sort of world that he was in. And so for me, that was the perfect lens to use because it kind of gives you the feeling of the world caving in on you, like it. You know, he's sitting in this beautiful environment and it feels like the world's caving in. And, you know, I'm hoping that it wasn't too extreme, you know, like because there's a point where it gets you out of the story. There's a point where you're engrossed and you're hopefully watching him and you're feeling sort of like the world's caving in. Um, mm. And so, yeah, that was the reason for that lens. And and listen, I, I've, I've only just discovered those lenses on, on the Batman and loved them and kept them as part of my kit and think that they're fantastic. So we used the Helios and the Jupiter a lot on June part two, amongst other lenses, but we used them a fair bit. Do you, oh. uh, are you involved in uh, all the way through through visual effects? And and uh, do you use, uh, you know, the aesthetic of those lenses in some of the VFX shots? I generally as a rule as a cinematographer i am not involved in vfx mm -hmm. and the reason is is because it takes such a long time i'm already onto other jobs by the time the vfx are being done or i'm in mm -hmm. another country or I'm, I'm on like it's it's a bit of an antiquated system let me just tell you because the reality was that back in the 50s you would shoot a movie you would edit a movie then you would grade and you release so the dp would shoot go away grade the movie and then you know have a champagne at the opening at the at the, the release mm. whereas now because the vfx are relensing stuff that you've already done and creating vfx to that world the, the 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 system hasn't really caught up the production designer generally isn't involved either in this day and age 
for, with the VFX, which is a really antiquated system and it's broken, if you ask me. Like, it seems mm -hmm. crazy that the, 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 it's like having, not involving an architect in the build of a house. You know, like it's, you know, it seems like yeah. that type of craziness. Um, but yeah, on, on that one, um, I wasn't, but we have, we had a really good VFX supervisor, Paul Lambert, who, who very much thinks about light and understands that things need to match in. So his, his take always that we shot as much in camera as possible. So then it was up to the VFX people to match what we had done. So there was, it would stand out like, you know, I mean, as they say in Australia, New Zealand, stand out like dog's balls. If something um, was wrong, when the whole film looked a certain way. Would you like Indeed. to be in a, involved in a project where you're kind of all the way all the way to the end whether it's like an animated film or like a fully virtual like uh avatar right like yeah. you know yep yep um yes and no because the thing is that i also get bored very quickly <laughs> and i'm also i like to be busy and i like to be kind of moving and this is why again i think i said before there's a job for everyone on a film set you know like for me the job of a dp is great because every every five minutes there's something new to to do like or, or to change or to solve what a problem or whereas when you're doing vfx it can be a lot slower it's a different temperature and a different kind of tempo so this is where i'm really excited by the by the world of unreal engine and 3d gaming engines because i can place my stamp on what will become a v effect later but right now i'm lighting and i'm lensing so my dna or the DNA that that I've created with the director goes into the work that we're building, and then it just literally just follows through. And so there are people like Paul Lambert, you know, who I'm working with right now, and I worked with him on June Part Two, who's who's a who's a you know absolute you know kind of advocate of that that way of working. Mm. Now look at let's look at that famous green tint that plagued the Blu-ray release of Fellowship of the Ring for years. This happened so late in the game, and Andrew Lesney was certainly not there in the room, and I don't think Peter was in the room either, but by the time they had done a digital remaster for the Blu-ray release of Fellowship of the Ring, suddenly things just went into the color grading dustbin. Something mm. happened, and it wasn't corrected until many, many, many years later. It's a Now it's a famous story in the home video legacy of the lord of the rings um yeah. i've got my new 4k uhd um and they fixed it and then the conversation was wow is this what fellowship of the ring really looks like now because we've been watching our old blu-rays for so many years and that oh, wow. weird patina is gone and uh, that's why you know i, I want to back up justin's question isn't it you know doesn't it behoove uh department heads to come in and be involved later on in color grading so that things like that wouldn't happen. What do you think? It, it, you know, it, it fully does. It fully does. It fully does. And, and that's why, like, if I could be involved in every single shot that I, that I do all the way through till the final, um, you know, Netflix deliverable or Amazon prime or whatever, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, HBO, whatever streaming service it goes to. But then what's the next step? I go to every house and make sure that their, their <laughs> TVs are set up properly. And, but I mean, I say that in jest, obviously, right? Because I do that every time I visit my mum's house and I turn off her smoothing and I turn off all Oh those gosh, things. I just did that for my mom a few weeks ago. I... Yeah, yeah. And then, and then she'll did. turn it back on again, probably, right? So yeah, but, they had no so, clue. <laughs> but the point is, is that I, I could, it, to take it to its illogical extreme, I, I, I probably would have to go and do that. I have to go and make sure that every phone that they're being watched on in the right circumstances, that the blinds are down in the house. I mean, obviously that's ridiculous, right? But, <laughs> um, but there is, you're right, there is a point at which you have to let it go out into the world. It's like letting a child go out into the world. You, know, you, you just have to let it go. And you have to pray to God that something like that green tint doesn't happen. You know, yeah. like it's... It's, 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 uh, that gives me anxiety thinking about that. I, I went into, so I did a film called Zero Dark Thirty quite a few years ago now, like with, with 10, Catherine Bigelow. 14. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And as you know, at the end of that movie, it's quite dark, thus the name. And the raid takes place in near darkness. And that was the point. Catherine and I spoke about this going, 
it, when it cuts to darkness, it's got to be dark, dark, as in struggle to see. And then it cuts to sub subjective, subjective night vision mode. And Catherine even suggest, suggested at one point, crazily, but not crazily, she goes, why don't we do the whole thing just with sound? To turn the images off for half an hour, just do it with sound, just to have some, you know, muzzle flash. But we explored that idea. It, obviously, I think we made the right call in not doing that. Mm. But um, I went to go and see, this, see the movie at Santa Monica um, Cinema, and I was all excited by that. And what they had done, because the end was darker, they had turned the entire film up in terms of brightness to compensate. So they'd either increased the level of their projector or, or done whatever they... They do the, the whole movie. And the rest of the movie was the, brighter. The whole movie, and I could not oh, sit dear. through it. I'm sitting there watching the first oh, five scenes, going, "How is this so bright?" And then it occurred to me, and I spoke to the manager, and said, "This film doesn't look right." He goes, "What's wrong with it?" And I explained to him. I said, "Listen, I shot it, and this is not how it's supposed to look." <laughs> and he said, "Quite." He said, "Quite honestly, listen, I think we've turned it up because people were complaining about the back was too dark." So. It's oh like, my. well, it doesn't matter what the art, what the artists want. You know, the uh, the filmmakers want it to be dark so that as an audience you immerse. You, you you get people at the other ends just turning the projector up in in brightness. So, anyway, mm. that's not to, that's not to excuse somebody letting a green tinted um, DVD through, you know, through the process. But yes, wow. I, mean, I love to be involved all the way. But it's it's tough. It's tough. Wow. The, you, yeah, I understand. You, you bring up. Like the ultimate debate that's currently happening in fanboy culture, let's just call it, right? And, and you know, because you've worked with Batman and Star Wars and Dune, like you just said that, you know, at what point is, is the artiste uh, th opinion respected versus the viewer who's complaining that the mm. movie's too dark? Uh, how do you navigate or do you even consider like, you know, what the... What 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 longtime fans of Dune and Batman and Star Wars want out of their franchise when you're doing your job? Because that is the debate. Every every Star Wars fan thinks they can do a better Star Wars, right? <laughs> like, yep. Yep. So does it, that it, come it, into well, your head? It does. It 100 percent does. And let me tell you something that I've learned over the years. And I can I'll tell you a couple of stories from Rogue One that that might sort of provide an example of this. So when I first got the gig as the DP of the first standalone Star Wars film, which is what Rogue One was, it wasn't a Skywalker film, it was the first standalone Star Wars film. I remember I did meetings all around Lucasfilm and ILM, like I went in to meet everybody, like all the long time Star Warsian kind of heads of design and VFX. And like, there's, there's a lot of people who are very well invested in, in Star Wars in San Francisco and the world, of course, but as a company, they're, they're super well invested. And I remember I went in to meet, let's say Joe Bloggs. I mean, I'm not going to name names because it's not relevant, but you know, you can imagine who they are. They're kind of, they're, they're high up, very clever, very famous, lovely Star Warsian people, you know, met them. Hi, Greg. Yeah. But Joe, good to meet you. Blah, blah, blah. Um, so tell me how you're going to shoot Rogue One. It's an interesting one because, you know, it's the first standalone film. You, you're going to shoot film, right? Because the originals were shot on film. That, you know, that might have been one chat. It's like, oh, you know, what? we haven't actually tested yet. We don't know. Next conversation. Are oh, you going to shoot digital, right? Because film's such an outdated thing that George shot the new ones on digital. And so what I learned, basically, was that everybody has their own opinions of what Star Wars is and what the Batman is. Everybody. Even you guys with with you know, your Lord of the Rings. I'm sure you're more aligned than most everyone because you probably know each other well now. But if you were to both be separated and go out and make your own thing, you probably have elements of that franchise that is more appealing to you than 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 somebody else. So, and I learned that on, on Rogue One was that everybody understands Star Wars differently. And so for me, it was really important that I got on the same wavelength as Gareth who, you know, I, I've always said that Star Wars runs in his veins because effectively it was probably one of the first films that he'd ever seen, one of the first films that I'd ever seen on VHS, you know, like Star Wars and New Hope and Empire Strikes Back, I, I wore out on my, on my VHS. So I could almost say that subconsciously part of my language, my learning um, of, of that franchise was 
learning it through watching it on VHS, you know, and watching Darth Vader come through the door with the smoke around him and lasers shooting at him. And like, you know, so that's ingrained in my psyche. So uh, trying to then balance that with what the fans want is I'm the fan. Do, do you know what I mean? Like I'm the fan because I can only really do it for the way my director sees the world and the way I see the world. Like I, it's it's kind of the type of thing where you can't please all of, what is it please all the people all the time. You know what I mean? There's mm -hmm. that saying, mm -hmm. and I think ultimately, if I do the best job that I can to um, to to tell a scene, then I hope that the audience is going to be happy. Like actually, that leads me to another to, to, on Rogue One. It was interesting going back to that for a second. Um, there's a scene in Rogue One that I think is one of my favorite scenes to have shot, and that's the Vader scene at the end of the movie. Where yes. Vader takes out all those all those rebels, iconic. Um, There's no other way to describe it except it's iconic. It's fantastic. So, so funny story. So yeah, obviously, like you know, I was talking to Gareth about what that is, and Gareth's like, okay, so they they hand the, the data through. It it gets through. The doors jammed. The lights go down, and we look into darkness. You know, like we're, we're tracking into darkness, and then Darth Vader appears. And we're like, cool, what a great appearance of Vader. I mean, we've seen him in the movie already, but like, you know, it's the appearance from blackness, this, this thing. And when we were doing all the tests, like he turns his lightsaber on and and the lightsaber front lights, because that's what it does. It's, it's a light in front of him. And it didn't look that interesting because Vader front lit doesn't look very menacing. I'll just tell you right uh, now. Uh. He looks pretty, pretty plasticky. So we started playing with light behind so that as the as the lightsaber comes on, he becomes more of a silhouette, which, again, if you go, I've probably destroyed it for everyone now. If you go back and watch it, it doesn't make any sense. The light doesn't make any sense whatsoever. <laughs> but aesthetically, it kind of, aesthetically what it is is that memory of that scene where Vader walks through the mist, through the dust of the smoke of the door that blows. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's that shape of Vader. It's that memory of Vader that I was personally trying to put back into that um, into that scene. Now, another fun fact, that scene, that's the scene I met Peter Jackson. He came to visit Gareth Oh, when we were filming that scene. Oh, how cool. How he was cool. living, I think he was living close by and he and Gareth <laughs> were in, in close communication. And I think he he came in to visit to say hi. Because that's delightful. Cause Gareth, cause Gareth um, was working closely at that point in time with Jay Bears Olsen, who who edits with Peter. Hmm. So Jay right. Bez was doing doing work on Star Wars that point right. time. So there's the, there was two degrees of separation. So did you have he a, was there. Did you have a dialogue? <laughs> oh yeah, we chatted. We chatted, of course. Like it's, uh, you know, Australia and New Zealand are small. I mean, there's like six people in the entire, you know, country. So <laughs> we all know each, we all know the same people. I love it. I love it. Now, um, uh, well, real thinking... quick, uh, uh, on the Darth Vader story, you know what ah. it, re it reminds me of? <laughs> uh, Sean Astin has a story. They were on set for the Two Towers, which Dune Two is, co is compared to, and they're, they've uh, Andrew Lesney has lit Helm's Deep, and there's these giant skylights, and you know it's nighttime, so these giant bright skylights uh, backlighting all the fog, you know, for everybody. And Sean asks Andrew. Um, at, where's that light coming from in universe? Like, is there a moon? And Andrew just looks at Sean and says, uh, that light's coming from the same place the music's coming from. <laughs> Dude, that's, that's a gold response. I have I've never <laughs> heard that before, but that's a great response. Use it. Use it in the future when <laughs> some intern is asking you something like that. <laughs> that's so it, funny. It's a great response, and it sounds exactly like something something that you know a, um, an experienced DP would say. Because we are constantly breaking rules. Like I don't know if you've ever watched a film, and everybody's backlit, so you cut from there to there to there to there to there, and everybody's got backlight. It's magic. <laughs> it's, it's like it's movie it's magic. Like magic. It's movie magic. <laughs> now nobody ever notices it. And another thing to watch it, it, again, if you're going back to Rogue One. The, the the scene in Above Scarif, the Battle of Scarif, Above Scarif, mm -hmm. like there's definite shadows on all their ships. 
But do you ever see a sun? Do you ever see a sun in Star Wars? There's no I get it. sun. So how, what's creating sunlight? Like, I mean, it's movie magic. No one, no one even questions it. No one questions it. The same place. So I think well, well, well done, <laughs> no, I Andrew. It. Those things. Um, I love. I have to admit, before we leave the Star Wars um, conversation, I love Rogue One for a certain quality. If I had to give a one-word movie review, and this is a thing that Justin and I used to do, one-word movie review, I would say windswept. There's a quality. Oh. There's an there's an outdoor quality. While I feel there's a lot of interiors in all of Star Wars, but Rogue One for me felt like I was feeling the wind on my face almost wow. all the time. And I loved that windswept quality. Um, from the very beginning, you know, yeah. with the wind playing on the blades of grass, really? when the little girl is hiding in the cave, all the way through to the end on the beach and the big, big, big bang at the end of the film. I felt the wind. It was, I don't know if you knew what you were doing in regards to that. And, and maybe, you know, maybe it wasn't intended, but I loved it. I loved that quality of Rogue One. I really do. Let, let me. Th that, that's that's an awesome observation. It, mm. we, we, I don't think we ever would have set out and intended for that to be the the, the the word, the review word. But I reckon what we were trying to achieve, which is all related, by the way, and it's so which 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 completely um, backs up what you're saying, is that there needs needs to be a, a texture. There needs to be an environmental texture to 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 the world. Now part of that environmental texture is wind part of it is rain part of it is water part of it is kind of you know dust in the air or water it's in in, in you know in the um uh in the rainy planet i've lost my lost my track i've lost my naming conventions now um but you know they, exactly this it's water wind rain like it's all the elements and mm -hmm. and, and is constantly when you're making a film you are fighting those elements because wind creates noise on the microphone and you try and cut the wind and therefore there's no wind on people and you try and put the wind back by silent little e-fans and wind machines but by doing that you kind of lose that element that you talked about that wind swiftness or that mm -hmm. or that elemental kind of fear thing and and the, the 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 beginning of the film one of the first things we shot was in iceland for the prologue of the film and that was some of the worst weather I think I've ever seen. I've experienced some bad weather in New Zealand because New Zealand well, yeah. is another place to get bad weather. But yeah. Iceland, I mean, I don't know if you've ever experienced rain that goes up, but that's what happened in Iceland. There's it 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 doesn't it doesn't hit the ground. It, it somehow <laughs> there's a vortex that it sweeps up, and anything under your jacket gets wet because there's water coming up your jacket. Wow. So, I mean, extreme levels of of rain and wind and water and yeah, it was it was wild, and we. What was good though is that we saw the dailies on that and went, well, that's the film, this this film, because that's how we remembered a new hope, you know, and an Empire Strikes Back, and that's how we remembered it, not necessarily the way it is, but I remember like we remember it as being textual. Maybe it's because we're watching it on VHS, you know. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Uh Lord of the Rings fans are, are coming to terms with this idea that that for the first time uh, that this cinematic thing that everybody fell in love with, you know, record Oscar winner. By the way, uh, someone uh, uh, gave us the stat that Dune is the second most awarded Oscar film in the visual effects category, second only to Lord of the Rings. Dune really? has won v eight VFX Oscars. And Lord of the Rings won ten, or something like that. Wow! So wow! And you're wow. only two, and you're only two out of three, right? Now. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Um, but yeah. but is there since you've since you've played with Star Wars in both TV and film, are there different considerations? I mean, we've talked about the large formats and everything else. Like, are there different yeah. cinematography considerations? Because prestige TV is pitched marketed as cinematic yeah. at home but it really yeah. isn't so are the did you make different considerations from a lensing standpoint i mean fundamentally no i can say but the reality is that when you're shooting for imax you don't shake the camera as much when you're hand holding because to sit in an imax theater with a handheld camera can be a little bit disconcerting mm -hmm. versus tv like if you're watching it on your iphone or your tv at home you can afford to shake the camera a bit more so 
there are those factors about operating. Um, but cinema, cinematography wise and cinemagraphically, no, no, I would be always trying to make my images as cinematic, whatever that might mean, or as, or as emotional or emotive is as possible. That would be my intention always. Hmm. Can we talk a, a little bit about color? Um, in, in many other interviews, you acknowledged your wife and how much that she's taught you about color. And I was listening to the commentary track uh, with uh, Lothlorien, where Andrew Lesney was talking about some of his difficult choices in handling the color and how things yeah. changed after they left the darkness of Moria. We arrive and, and meet Kate Blanchett and all the elves. And he said that he wanted Lothlorien to be a very different world, an intellectual world. And he said that he went for lavender as a color with lavender gels and tried to push some of the blues over to a lavender place. And yet he professed that lavender was one of those colors that, in his words, doesn't register really well with its subtlety on camera. And yet he felt that he prevailed uh, with, you know, in that scene, in those scenes with the various techniques. But have you also been up against a real delicate color palette or something that was problematic? I mean, I mean, obviously this might steer into the infra, the famous infrared work that you did on GD Prime. Um, but have, have you ever had a color that was like a real bastard that was hard to work yeah. with on camera? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the opening scene, which is we call famously scene 10 in our movie, which is the uh, eclipse mm. scene. It's that famous scene 10 because it takes place over seven pages and it's like a Magilla of a, uh, of a scene. It's just like hard, really hard to, to do, but you know, that was done with a with with a filter that was um it it wasn't an infrared filter, but what it did is it reduced the the blues and the greens. It wasn't a red filter, it was an it reduced the nanometer uh throughput of color. So it wasn't a pure red or an orange or a, it, it restricted depending on the way that you turned it. Um and so that one was a really hard one to find because we wanted it to be not monochrome, we wanted it there to be some color. We wanted them to be some green, some blue, but it's tiny elements of it. But finding the right balance of that, the entire film got graded really quickly. Like we we had a, a great dailies colorist. We were all in sync because we'd done part one. We all knew what we were doing. It felt like a, a really well-honed machine. But that scene, yeah. I, I remember, like I I delivered the, the film graded to Denis. And then Denis was obviously still doing his VFX reviews and, yeah, he rang me a few times and said, man, I've, I've got to have a look at that scene again. I'm not convinced it's right. And, you know, at that point I, I was off doing something else. Um, but, yeah, we're talking small tweaks, right? We're talking small tweaks. Um, and and did, he, didn't you do yeah. a, a, a film intermediate? Uh, we did. We yeah, did. Were, were you yeah, nervous we about that? No, no, because we did it on part one. We tested it. My, my lab in LA, Photochem, is so dialed in and so buttoned down when it comes to you know film is an analog thing which it can go and change like it can that's what people love about it is it can give them happy little accidents or little mistakes that they hadn't been planning for um but i that they have it so well dialed in that they can sort of you know almost mathematically translate color from a digital grade to a to a film output you know knowing that um so the the, the reason why that color wasn't was tricky wasn't because of that it was tricky because we had we had shot it in a really unorthodox way with this filter that was kind of i mean yeah yeah it was probably not the type of filter that i'd want to use again but it, it was great for that and it, it created that, that that look of the eclipse which is the whole purpose um so yeah it was that was a tricky one so i yeah i i i, I, I feel andrew's pain when it comes to those things because it's when you, there are some of those scenes that just don't quite sit right, that that have to be kind of manipulated and evolved. Well, good thing mm. the Harkonnen storyline is done, right? Don't have to go back there. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> well um, it might be it might be a funny little you know tri side note of mental trivia, but you did daytime fireworks the same way that Andrew Lesney had to do daytime uh, fireworks coming out of Gandalf's cart, 
Okay. Yeah. We yeah. had nighttime fireworks in the birthday party with the big dragon swooping over the hobbit's party. But in the daytime scene, you know, Gandalf is entertaining the children by shooting off some daytime fireworks. And, you know, this was done with technology from 23, 24 years ago. And here you are blowing people's minds with these unexpected plasma fireworks in a bizarre daytime Harkonnen sky. And it was so cool and so unexpected. Um, did you actually give thought to the placement of those VFX or did that come down the train later on? No, I mean, the, the, the concept was really interesting. And again, I mean, Denis, Denis is a master when it comes to his imagination. Um, but he's, he started talking to me about like, like anti fireworks, like what does an anti light look like? What does a like a negative sun look like? Or a, like, you know, a, what a, like, would it take light away, in which case it's black, which is not very cinematic. If there's nothing, if there's no light, then what do you see? Like, that was the conversation. It was kind of going, all right, what does a, what does a, 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 a sun look like that takes away light or fireworks that, that sucks the light out like a black hole, but for light, like, how does that, how does that look? And we, we agreed that obviously, you know, a sun that sucks the light out of a set is not a smart idea for, for a 10 minute scene. Right, because right? it's it goes black, <laughs> yes. but what we decided was actually what it does is it sucks the color out, the visible light as we know it. You know the, and the the fireworks do the same thing, which effectively is why they're that that black kind of that plasma kind of world. So yeah. that was kind of the idea. They, they they suck the all the visible light from the from the scene. Fascinating. Wow. It's wow. deeply fascinating. Um, it's what's it, good about it. What I found was 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 quite good about that was that it actually um, helped explain also why the Harkonnen look the way they do. Because you think about it, there's no no infrared, no ultraviolet, no visible light. That they kind of don't have a chance. That, you know, the alopecia, don't have, their hair doesn't grow, their their skin doesn't tan. Yeah. You know, there's a reason why they look the way they look. Mm. It it for for me, you know, as soon as we got to that planet, we saw everybody looking like that. It it. Brought to mind to me uh, what uh, Jackson and Lesney did with with Galadriel in the first Lord of the Rings movie when she goes into like dark, like I will be your evil queen. Like they played with some like inverse uh, stuff. I don't think they they had uh, an infrared infrared uh, camera at the time, but uh, it was a good use of te uh, digital cinema, you know, technology. Uh, yep. that you did and uh, I hope future um, Lord of the yeah, Rings people it was, will take that in mind yeah it was really good to have that actually up our sleeve to do that so yeah, yeah. all right I got one more question hey guys, I, oh good 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 so that's just to say I need to uh, I need to wrap yeah up. So, um, it, and it's the number one question it's the one everyone asked people love your work you know and, and you obviously have a, an impressive uh, respect and care for all these different franchises and the different things that friend uh classic stories bring to the audience uh would you entertain lord of the rings like is fantasy a genre you want to play in or are you kind of like mr sci-fi oh good question no. yeah it is a good question i mean i listen I, I think i said it earlier on i get i get bored quite quickly you know so I, i'm really happy i would love to get into you, you know like a romantic comedy or a musical or a or a fantasy or like for me it's 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 I don't necessarily choose a project based on the genre because as we know there are lots of people doing sci-fi not well you know or Star Wars not well or whatever that might be so it's like I want to be doing stuff that's really well done so absolutely would I would I understand fantasy absolutely and in fact I have in the past and films have gone away and you know like there are things that I've been you know, attached to and working on that have been in that in that space that have unfortunately not continued. So, um, yeah, I'm just waiting for the call, man. Just waiting for the call from the from the right director with the right script. You hear that, I Hollywood? Love <laughs> I love it. I love that. I love that. Well, that, thank that's you. Promising, very promising. And yes, thank you. My gosh, thanks for your time um, and your and your insights. This has been an extraordinary conversation. My pleasure, absolute pleasure, guys. Thank you. It's always a, it's always a, it's a pleasure to talk to fans and to people who are passionate about their, uh, about their worlds. There yeah, is, it, it's fun. Yeah, 
there, there, there is something to be said about appreciating the art form, the art form of a really good book, like, you know, a 1200 page novel about wizards and hobbits and evil rings. But there's another thing, and this is what we hope to achieve today, so we could bring our audience closer to appreciating and understanding your art form. And because you have elevated ev everything that you have touched, and I, I don't mean to be this way, but everything that you've put your hands on, you have elevated with your artistry you. and your good sensibilities and, and your technique. And it's been so great to watch your career evolve and grow from place to place from, you know, very early work from lion. And, and here's, and here we are Dev Patel about to release his directing mm -hmm. debut this weekend. And, you know, it's so exciting to see the arc of your career come from a place to another huge place and congratulations on all the great stuff you're doing in Frank Herbert's world. It is much appreciated. I'm, I might be a hardcore ringer fan, uh, but I'm just a big Dune head as well. I really, really am. And awesome. it's, it's great to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you, Clifford. Thank you, Justin. All right. This is Torn Tuesday. Thank you for joining us. We are here every week and we want to thank Greg Frazier and we'll see you next week. We'll see you guys next week. It's time to close out the show. Take good care of yourselves. We will be back again next Tuesday at 5 o'clock p.m. Pacific time live to give you more news, analysis, and maybe a little bit of mischief from the world of J.R.R. Tolkien. Thank you again, Greg Fraser, our special guest. Thank you, Justin, for pulling the production strings behind the little green curtain. Much appreciated, young man. You guys do take care of yourselves and be kind to one another. We'll see you next week. Until then, good night and good luck. Or better yet, buenos noches y buena suerte. Bye, everyone.